We will now transition to member statements. I recognize the member for Eglinton Lawrence. I have the pleasure of rising today to speak about a great organization in my riding of Eglinton Lawrence uh, that has Excuse been me. helped. Excuse me. We, uh, we made a, a rookie error. I will uh, recognize the member. I recognize the member for Niagara Center, and I apologize. No problem. We could have kept going, Speaker, but congratulations on your appointment. I rise today to talk about a crisis facing abused women in my riding. Women's Place of South Niagara is being forced to close Serenity House, which since 1996 has been a safe haven for women and children fleeing domestic violence in the city of Welland. Chronic underfunding by the provincial government has forced Women's Place to fundraise to be able to stay open over the years. Each year, the agency must raise approximately $550,000 to maintain programs and keep the lights on. But the COVID-19 lockdowns made that nearly impossible. So at a time when this service is needed the most, the agency has to make the difficult decision to consolidate operations at Nova House in Niagara Falls and close the 10-bed shelter at Serenity House in Welland. Jennifer Gauthier, Executive Director of Women's Place of South Niagara, tells me the decision to close the Welland shelter was not taken lightly. Not only have domestic violence rates increased during the pandemic, but the severity of the injuries suffered by victims has also escalated. Mr. Speaker, it's time this government pulled its head out of the sand and addressed the crisis faced by women's shelters across the province. They need a multi-year commitment to increased funding so they can continue their important work supporting women in crisis in these especially desperate times. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Now I look to the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. I apologize for that earlier. I have the pleasure of rising today to speak about a great organization in my riding of Eglinton Lawrence that's been helping people of Toronto and York find employment for decades. Last night, I had the honour of attending the JVS, Toronto's 74th annual AGM, as they prepared themselves for the future. It's been a very difficult year, and their new mantra is, the world has changed, our vision has not. JVS was founded in 1947 with the goal of helping victims of the Holocaust and veterans of the Second World War find employment as they moved beyond the horrors of war to rebuild their lives here in Ontario. As JVS experienced success in helping the Jewish community, it expanded its outreach to serve the broader community in finding work. JVS holds its values four values in particular as important, excellence, collaboration, integrity, and respect. And these are values, of course, worth celebrating. And they lead to great things for people. Values not only important in finding work, but in helping people reach their full potential. Um, I want to congratulate all the award winners recognized last night um, and the board members, staff, volunteers, clients of JVS, and particularly the retiring president and CEO, Kim Coulter, for her 31 years of service to JVS. Civic-minded institutions like JVS are the cornerstone of communities here in Ontario, like my own in Eglinton Lawrence, and I am very, very proud of all the work that they're doing and happy to congratulate them on all of their efforts. Keep up the great work. Thank Good you. Work. Member Statements, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. After this long summer recess, this PC government restarted the legislature with a lackluster speech from the throne that, among other things, failed to mention back to school. It failed to mention education entirely. And yesterday was World Teachers' Day. We were all again reminded that this government had yet to prioritize public education during this pandemic. Since the beginning, we should have seen what has been begged for by, by education workers, parents, families, students, and the opposition. Smaller class sizes, air quality standards and reporting, fewer kids on buses, staffing supports, and testing kits. However, since the beginning, what we have seen is this government turning its back on students. I fervently believe in public education, and full disclosure, I was an elementary school teacher for a long time. So I fundamentally believe in investing in the futures of kids. I believe in strong public services. I don't believe in disassembling a world-class education system while folks are distracted by a pandemic to stealthily scrap it and sell it for parts. 
which appears to be the goal of this Premier and government, frankly. I am hearing from the education world that children as young as kindergarten are fighting, running out of school, self-harming, and struggling desperately. Times are brutal. Our classrooms and our students need care and investment. More and more teachers and education workers are frantically trying to leave the profession. We don't have enough EAs or custodians. Teachers are trying to take early retirement. Perhaps if this government didn't attack and neglect them, they might feel that they could continue. This government's aggressive agenda of cuts and privatization makes me sick, and so my message to this Premier is end the attacks and support public education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today to announce another critical investment in Sarnia Lambton by the Government of Ontario. Speaker, as part of the 2021 provincial budget, our government announced the historic investment of $240 million over four years in Ontario's tre children's treatment centres and preschool speech and language programs. As a result, I'm pleased to announce that Pathways Health Centre for Children, our local children's treatment centre, will receive an increase in annualized funding of over $1.1 million or a 24 per cent increase <clears throat> to help them deliver important services and support children and youth in our community. Already, Pathways provides a range of essential rehabilitation services to over 3,400 children and youth families. This $1.1 million investment will help them to build service capacity and increase uh, access to preschool speech and language services and community and uh, school-based rehabilitation services. Mr. Speaker, we know that early intervention leads to better long-term outcomes for children and youth. By improving access <coughs> to assessments and early intervention services, children will begin receiving services and working towards goals sooner. This investment in Pathways Health Centre for Children is an investment in the children and young people of Sarnia Lambton. Together with our partners at Pathways, this provincial government is working so every young person has the best opportunity to achieve their life's goals and be set up for success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time of year, millions of birds are migrating across the Great Lakes to winter in Ontario, and million, millions of more are migrating south. But many do not make it. Windows that reflect the sky and clouds can appear invisible to a moving bird, so they continue to fly at high speeds until they smack into the glass and fall to the ground. The bird photographer Bria Ramsing writes that if you walk around one of the city's large towers during the migratory season, you'll find the bodies of dead birds with their feet curled up in the air. These are brilliantly colored birds, including electric blue indigo buntings, warblers with yellow green and blue wing markings, and scarlet tanagers with regal red feather plumage. Flap Canada states that over 25 million birds die through collisions with windows in Canada each year. Let's see. Thankfully, we have a way to dramatically reduce bird collisions with windows. Nearly 19,000 people have signed a petition asking to prevent further damage to bird populations, including petitions by BirdSafe and Flap Canada. This week, I am introducing a motion to adopt the Canadian Standards Association 2019 Bird-Friendly Design Standard into the Ontario Building Code for all new construction in the province of Ontario. This is a proactive and inexpensive measure that will protect Ontario's biodiversity for years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member's statements. The member for um, Ottawa, Orlando. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for months, optometrists in Ontario have been trying to have discussions with the government about the challenges in the OHIP funding model. And despite months of warnings uh, that they would withdraw their service, the government chose not to engage with, with optometrists to resolve their concerns. OHIP covered eye exams ended over a month ago, and the Ontario government continues to be absent from meaningful discussions with the Ontario Association of Optometrists. Eyesight is not a luxury, Mr. Speaker. Imagine you're the mom of two eye tests to perform their best at school and to participate in the extracurricular activities that they've been missing for so long. Their eye tests were cancelled, Mr. Speaker. These examens de vue couverts par l'assurance de santé ont pris fin il y a plus de Eye tests stopped a month ago 
the entire government is not negotiating with the Optometrist Association of Ontario. Imagine that you are at the head of a an elderly house like David. David cannot see with one of his eyes. It's an easily corrected condition with glasses. Unfortunately, David cannot get an appointment with an optometrist. We need a solution now. ...and work out a deal so that they can once again provide world-class eye care to Ontarians. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, as you know, uh, Haldeman Norfolk boasts an abundance of uh, fairs and festivals unique to our varied and rich farm heritage. These fairs, festivals, parades cap off the planting season, the harvest seasons, and signify a, a celebration of sorts after months and months of hard work. Dunbell hosts the Mudcat Festival and its summer fair as well. Port Rowan has Bayfest, there's a Langton Fair, Houghton Fair. Simcoe's Friendship Festival, Donnybrook in Charlotteville, Fall Fest in Delhi, and then the uh, quaint town of Waterford, well known for its Pumpkin Fest. Well, some of these festivals have been sidelined during the pandemic. I was pleased last week that the show was on once again in Caledonia for their Fall Fair. Great time was had by all, I can attest. Next year will be their 150th fair. And just yesterday, the famous Norfolk County Fair and Horse Show kicked off their 181st year. The fair has in place many safety precautions. Um, we're still able to take, uh, take in the uh, traditional events, the livestock shows. Entertainment coming up includes Tim Hicks and the James Barker Band. So as the area MPP, I'm so heartened. A tremendous amount of work goes forward from our volunteers and kudos to all for uh, soldiering through these time-tested traditions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. The next statement, the member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it's uh, too bad uh, we are not allowed to have visitors in the gallery these days, and I'm, I'm sure that Mike Wood, the founder and main advocate for Hamilton Tenants and Unity, would be sitting in our gallery listening intently as the problems he and our office are witnessing with residential tenants who are being harassed, shamed, scared and bullied throughout Hamilton. Local media headlines such as exterior door removed by landlord or on-site laundry machines increased to $20 for a wash and dry may seem strange and like anything people from more affluent communities are accustomed to hearing, but my office hears these strange complaints from tenants every day. What do you tell a person who is in tears in her early 70s and has been informed that she doesn't uh, leave, she has to leave herself $700 a month apartment for renovations, she will be evicted and removed by a sheriff if she doesn't? How do you explain to her that the landlord and tenant board hearings are only being conducted virtually and that she'll have to buy, pay for, and learn to use a smartphone in the next few weeks or miss out on her chance to defend her home from outside investors who see no value in her living peacefully on Melvin Avenue and do not concern themselves that without this apartment she's bound for a life on the streets. Currently, the landlord and tenant board system is broken and the people of Hamilton know it. They see the bullying and harassment from investment class landlords and nameless numbered companies every day. They see their ever-increasing misery of overheated housing market. What, do they, what they don't see is a government that is doing anything about it while they leave the, and the fighting to homes to advocates like Mike and his ilk. Being forced out of your home at any age is a great mental and emotional burden, especially when there is nowhere to go that is even slightly close to being within your budget. We need to stop the profiteering and start listening to what our community needs, safe, secure and affordable housing. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Whitby. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The Ontario government has provided up to $696 million this year to help cover historic working fund deficits with a focus on small, medium, as well as specialty and rehabilitation hospitals. I'm pleased, Speaker, that this includes over $9 million for Ontario Shore Centre for Mental Health Sciences in Whitby in support of their world-class programs and services. Overall, Speaker Ontario Shores has been a recipient of approximately $16 million over the past three years from the government. Clearly, the government is determined, Speaker, to build a comprehensive and connected mental health and addiction system that benefits Durham Region residents and people in other parts of the province. Speaker, at the end of the day, our government remains committed 
absolutely committed to supporting hospitals like Ontario Shores and others in Durham Region so that they can continue to care for hard-working families today and in the future. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next member statement, the member for Barry Ennisville. Thank you, Speaker. As a representative for Barry Innisfil, I, I also represent a part of the manufacturing might that is Ontario. In Barry Innisfil, we have incredible companies that have been not only employing more people, helping to the province's economic recovery, but they're ready to take on more. And I wanted to uh, announce that our government has uh, contributed to the Skills Development Fund and the Second Career Program, so people can take advantage of these opportunities to, high, to have high-paid, skilled trade jobs. But there's businesses in Barry that are still looking for individuals, and our government has also invested in these manufacturing companies. Jomi, for example, they have a multi-year relationship with Tesla and Lucid Motors, and they plan to expand into the U.S. market. They've created 20 jobs and retained 23 jobs thanks to this government's investment, but they can take on more people and are ready to do so. Tempo Plastics also received additional funding from our government. Not only are they employing uh, 144 uh, individuals, but again, they also have the ability to take on more. Innovative Automation and Steve Loftus and, and Barry, they uh, received investment from, from Barry, or from this government, to allow for their automation sector to, glo to grow globally, and they can take on more individuals as they continue to innovate. Matsu Manufacturing in Barry also was able to receive funding from this government to create 24 new jobs, and certainly they can take on more. SBS Drive Tech in Barry and what they're doing, they have been able to double their production capacity capacity and optimize uh, efficiency thanks to this government. And lastly, TNR Doors is ready to expand. Uh, they have um, many employees now, but if you're looking, uh, check them out because there is so much manufacturing growth in Barrie and we're very excited for economic recovery. That concludes our members' statements for this morning. I'd like to bring to the attention of the House that on Monday, October 18th, a limited number of legislative pages will return to their duties in the chamber this fall. As we welcome them back to the legislative building, their health and safety, as well as everyone who has direct contact with them, is our top priority. That's why during this trial period, we have only accepted applications from grade eight students who've received both doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, as well as ensuring that anyone who works directly with the PAGE program is also fully vaccinated. We will continue to monitor the COVID-19 pandemic, as we all will, and our response to it, ensuring that all occupants of the precinct are protected. I beg to inform the House that the following document has been tabled, a report entitled Federal and Provincial COVID-19 Response Measures 2021 Update from the Financial Accountability Office of Ontario. The member for Ottawa South has informed me that he has a point of order that he wishes to raise. Uh, a point of order. I seek unanimous consent to move a motion without notice calling on the government of Ontario to immediately make COVID-19 vaccinations mandatory for all frontline health care and education workers in the province, including hospital workers, PSWs, and home and community care staff. Member for Ottawa South is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to move a motion without notice with respect to private members' public business. Agreed? No. I heard a no. I will ask for the House's attention. On June 14, 2021, the member for London West, Ms. Sattler, and the member for York Centre, Mr. Baber, rose on questions of privilege respecting the ability of members to rise on points of order to seek the unanimous consent of the House regarding the business of the day. The member for London West subsequently provided a written submission in support of her questions and gave an additional oral submission to the House yesterday. I am now prepared to rule on the questions raised by the members. Let us first revisit the events of June 14th, which was the last day the House sat before the summer recess. At various times during that day's proceedings, members rose on supposed points of order each time seeking the unanimous consent of the House to give immediate consideration to a private member's bill or a motion, or to move a substantive motion without notice. 
made over and over again, the requests cumulatively made it difficult for the House to conduct its scheduled business. As Speaker, I eventually found these requests to be disorderly and came to the view that they were being used for a dilatory purpose not provided for in the standing orders or the Assembly's practices. As a practical and reasonable response, I made the decision to ask the House if, if there was unanimous consent to consider any business other than the bill that had been called for debate. When that request was not granted, I chose to move on from any further unanimous consent requests and resume the business at hand. Let me remind members that, among other responsibilities, the Speaker has an obligation to ensure that the House is able to conduct the business that is before it. More on that later. In the course of the day's events, the members for London West and York Centre both raised concerns framed as issues of parliamentary privilege. While they raised objections related to the procedures and practices of the House, as well as the role and response of the Speaker to the events of June 14th, they did not establish that any parliamentary privilege had been breached. Let me remind members that there are a number of specific parliamentary privileges which, as Standing Order 23A indicates, may be categorized as either a member's individual privilege or a collective privilege of the House, quote, conferred by the Legislative Assembly Act and other statutes, or by practice, precedent, usage, and custom, end quote. The matters brought before the House by the two members would have been more appropriately raised as points of order, and I will respond to them now as such. Perhaps bears explaining what a point of order actually is. A point of order, according to the third edition of House of Commons Procedure and Practice at pages 636 to 638, and I quote, is an intervention by a member who believes that the rules or customary procedures of the House have been incorrectly applied or overlooked during proceedings. When recognized on a point of order, a member should state only which standing order or practice the member considers to have been breached, and if this is not done, the Speaker may request that the member do so." End quote. Standing Order 14 provides that when raising points of order, members are to make their points tersely and without interruption by other members. The Speaker's responsibility include the preservation of order and decorum in the House and ruling on points of order. The latter involves interpreting the rules and practices of procedure to address issues as they arise out of the proceedings. The Speaker may rule either immediately after a point of order is raised or after taking the necessary time to consider the standing orders and precedents. While the Speaker should hear a valid point of order when one is raised, the Chair retains the discretion not to entertain a member who persists with point of order. This discretion is supported by various procedural authorities. Erskine May, at paragraph 21.49 of the 26th edition, says, Speakers have exercised discretion over taking points of order. House of Commons Procedure and Practice at page 637 says, Points of order are often used by members in attempts to gain the floor to participate in debate. In such cases, the Speaker will not allow the member intervening to continue. Finally, Australia's House of Representatives practice at page 193 of the 7th edition says that when points of order are, which are inordinately long, frivolous, or of dubious validity are raised, the chair would normally intervene. What is a valid point of order? The question is sometimes muddled because of the occasional but long-standing practice of using points of order to gain the floor for purposes not actually related to matters of order. Speakers have not objected to allowing members from time to time to use points of order, for example, to apologize, to ask for a moment of silence, to seek unanimous consent to expedite the business of the House or waive notice, to vote on a motion without debate, to wish a member a happy birthday or announce the birth of a child, or on occasion to immediately pass a bill. Well, this has been somewhat common practice. It is one that is typically used sparingly and has mostly been used when there is no agreement among the parties to proceed with the request. In her written submission, the member for London West noted that the successive requests for unanimous consent that were made on June 14th were similar to requests that have been made on many occasions in this parliament, requests that at the time had been deemed acceptable. In her submissions made yesterday, the member made the point that conducting business by unanimous consent is very often helpful to the House, and indeed it occurs frequently enough in this House 
that it could be said to have entered the realm of established practice. And I agree. The member also said that historically there have been few limitations on the subject matter or nature of unanimous consent asked for. I also agree with this assertion, but this is the point where the distinction can be made between what has become an accepted practice in the House and what has happened on June the 14th deviated from that practice. The sheer extent and volume of those requests on June 14th was a striking and obvious change from the typical use of unanimous consent. In other words, it is not the case that when members simply utter the phrase point of order that the Speaker is then somehow obligated each and every time, without limit, to give members the floor and interrupt whatever other business is properly before the House. Indeed, previous Speakers have intervened to deal with the kind of dilatory measures that occurred on June the 14th. For instance, on April 2, 1997, at pages 7,523 to 24 of the debates, the House found itself in a very similar circumstance to the one that we're contemplating today. After members raised several lengthy points of order and requests for unanimous consent in succession, Speaker Stockwell decided to disallow further interventions so that the House could move on to the next proceeding providing the following explanation. I don't ever want to cut a member off from a point of order because I think it's very, very important that they have the right to stand on those points of order, but it's also very important that we're allowed to continue the business of the day. A few days later, on April the 6th, 1997, at page 8,386 of the debates, Speaker Stockwell elaborated on the role of the Speaker. I believe that a modern definition of speaker requires that decisions are taken are also in the best interest of the institution of parliament. On occasion, in particular when faced with extraordinary circumstances, speakers may have to intervene in a way which seeks to enable the parliamentary process to accomplish the business at hand. Our precedents are supported by similar decisions made in the House of Commons. In a ruling from May 27, 2019, at page 28,059 of the debates, Speaker Regan explained that the use of unanimous consent to expedite the business of the House quote, confers on the chair a certain discretion to determine to what extent a motion needs to be read, particularly when they are unusually lengthy, like this ruling, or when multiple motions are presented one after the other. On February the 6th, 2004, Speaker Milliken had stated at page 245 of the debates, I want to say right off that if every member had the right to stand up and ask for consent to move motions and then stood there, stood here and read motions all day, no business would be conducted in the House. In my view, members do not have such a right. They are asking for consent, and if consent is not going to be given, then we cannot have interminable requests for unanimous consent." End quote. Speaker Regan continued that requests for unanimous consent are not to be used as a method to thwart the rules of the House or as a dilatory tactic. Therefore, to uphold the integrity of the process, the, speak, the chair will continue to invoke its authority, particularly when it becomes clear that the motions are deliberately too lengthy, when they are continuously attempted in a repetitive way, or when they stray from the realm of debate. Applying these authorities to what happened on June the 14th, the requests may have been individually acceptable, but the volume and disruptive effect of these requests made it a matter of order requiring intervention by the chair pursuant to Standing Order 14A. Parenthetically, it's worth being mindful of the fact that when the business before the House, the, the business before the House could have just as easily been an opposition day or private members' public business, and to consider the impact of repeated and dilatory points of order in that context. The member for London West and the member for York Centre questioned the Speaker's decision to test the House by asking if there was unanimous consent to consider matters other than the business currently before it. Again, this was a prerogative of the Speaker, and is. Erskine May explains in paragraph 21.49 of the 26th edition that, quote, cases may arise upon which the rules of the House are indistinct or obsolete or do not cover directly to the issue at the point at issue. The Speaker will then usually give a ruling to cover the new circumstances on occasion referring the matter to the judgment of the House. Beauchene's Parliamentary Rules and Forms of the House of Commons of Canada, 6th edition, at page 98 states, sometimes instead of expressing an opinion on one side or the other, the Speaker may ask, ins ask instructions from the House. 
One example from our own practice occurred on March 2, 2006, at pages 2,364 to 65 of the debates. A member raised a point of order regarding the division procedure provided by a time allocation motion, arguing that it was out of order and proposed an alternative way of proceeding. While the member himself did not test unanimous consent, the Speaker took it upon himself to test the House to see if there was unanimous consent to address the issue raised by the point of order, and in that case there was. Finally, I will address the question raised by the member for York Centre, in which he asserted that, quote, there is nothing in the rules that preclude, precludes a member from rising on a motion without notice, whether it's brought under a point of order or not, end quote. In response, I will direct the member's attention to the definition of substantive motions contained in Standing Order 3, which states, such motions require notice and must be submitted to the Speaker in writing when moved before being put to the House for debate. As well, Standing Order 101 establishes the requirements for filing notice of and moving a private member's motion. So, in short, points of order will normally be heard and legitimate points of orders will be acknowledged and recognized. But if they are repeated over and over and they are intended to obstruct the business of the House, we may have to move on. I will conclude by stating that the House has exclusive control of its own proceedings and it has a long history of adapting in the face of change, changing circumstances and challenges so that it can continue to carry out its functions. I will continue to endeavour to maintain an appropriate balance between individual members' ability to gain the floor and the orderly progress of the business before the House. And I thank the members for their submissions.